disintegration of Yugoslavia is a, a traumatic memory for Russia and is the reason why uh, Russian foreign policy is purposefully fragmenting Ukraine when Ukraine receives support from the West to show it's to, to show that this is what it's like when we do it for you. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see We still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Arturo Di Simone's writings on politics and culture have appeared in Counterpunch, Compact, Open Democracy, The Fortnightly Review, and Sublation Magazine. From 2018 to 2021, he was a co-founding member of the Peace and International Policy uh, subdivision of the Democracy in Europe movement, which concerned itself with the movement's critiques of EU foreign policy and security issues. Today, we're going to be discussing his article for Sublation, which came out in May last year, called Game Over Theory, What Drove the Defeat of a European Radical Movement? Arturo, Welcome back onto the Diet Soap podcast. Glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you for your openness. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So your essay here about the European radical movement is a critique of the, the whole movement, but also it does zero in on, on Giannis Varoufakis quite a bit. And I think I'm going to title this podcast, The Meaning of Giannis Varoufakis. Let me start by asking you, what is the meaning? Uh, the meaning of Varoufakis. So uh, usually the name Yanis is spelled with two L's, whether in Greek or Latin alphabet. Uh, but he changed it to Yanis with one L. I'm not sure if he, he, he may have given an explanation as to why he did this. Uh, but... Uh, no, well, I don't know if that's, it's true. I don't know if it's relevant, but the meaning of uh, Varoufakis is, he, he is, um, uh, he is clearly, you know, very talented and brilliant and well-spoken, uh, <clears throat> but he is also uh, an embodiment of, uh, uh, of uh, all too familiar tragedies yeah for the, the left and the global left, even though he is presented clearly as an antidote to that, even though it is, again, a continuation of the phenomenon of the public intellectual who reads media codes very well and knows how to manage these, and of course, academics uh, occupying the for and center of the left, uh, what's more. Why, he, why did you mention that he changed his spelling of his name? What would the significance be for taking the, one of those ends out? Tell me, what, I, what was that hinting at? Well, I, I don't know. I was once in, in Greece, and somebody was telling me that in the past in Greece, there was a campaign to make the Greek language uh, the way it's written, more accessible to ordinary people, so to take out things that are archaic from the Greek of the past, and and so they made they they, they certain words that are of two ends would become of one. I and mean, I asked this person, "Is this why Yanis Rufakis changed his name?" And they, and this this man answered, "No, that's not why. Uh, he has given some other reason why. I, I don't know." But uh, it's like the, the artist formerly known as Prince or, exactly. I don't know, sometimes people want a signature of some sort. Yeah, I see. I see. So do you think that changing the, the spelling of his name indicates his uh, being vetted for 
international media, maybe something like so great that. Things. So great uh, So yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so, but earlier, uh, b- before we started re-recording, I um, asked you about how Giannis managed to take the failure of Syriza and, and his own failure to lead Syriza through the financial crisis. I mean, he wasn't prime minister, but he was the head of the fi- of finance and, uh, and turn that into a position of leadership on a, on a grander level in, you know, for the European left, um, or at least the, um, dissident left within the EU. How did that come about? Or why do you think it is that he managed his, you said to fail upwards in that way? Yeah. Uh, well, he is an alchemist. Uh, so he turns lead into gold in terrible failure. Um, of Syriza, he was able to, to, to distance himself from it just in time in a very clever way and an effective way because uh, he excited an authoritarian tendency in Tsipras. Uh, his conflicts with Tsipras were interpreted as uh, somebody with power suppressing a heretic who has no power. Uh, and I think we are right to dislike Tsipras <clears throat> and Yanis's party, the Greek outlets of it, Mera, returned into power as a protest vote against Syriza when they lost, then the, uh, the far right won and uh, Mera, which means they, uh, like Carpe Diem, D25, his movement in Greece, uh, in Greek, uh, they won. So he, he, won, he won re-election on the protest vote well, against the group he had been very, he had been implicated with, so embedded in. He was, uh, so when, uh, when Tsipras uh, invited uh, Varoufakis, who was a very, Varoufakis says that 20 people in the world at that time knew who he was, it's not the case. Greece is a small country, Greece is a big family. And he was a noteworthy person in Greece with his columns and articles. That's why uh, Tsipras uh, invited him because uh, he also seemed he would be inspiring to the youth. And Tsipras uh, was fascinated by the academic uh, content and quality of mm-hmm. Valsakis because Tsipras does, doesn't have that academic uh, style, even though many people in Sinitsa have PhDs. I think it was the party with the most PhDs in Greek history, which also should tell us something. But Varoufakis, uh, he wanted a, a, a complex contract of association with Sinitsa, much like, you know, much like Sanders, Bernie Sanders ran as an independent, although now Sanders is fully mm. internalized integrated into the Democratic Party. And uh, uh, Varoufakis negotiated a complex contract with Syriza so that he would be somewhat of an independent fellow traveler. But uh, he presented the, the capitulation as something that he struggled greatly to, to prevent. And as if he had no power, but he had power as the finance uh, minister, and for example, uh, and this is often this, this was pointed out by a uh, very marginalized uh, figure uh, on the left, marginalized mostly because he's old and he's the old school of the left. Uh, Eric Toussaint, uh, Frenchman, who's part of an anti IMF movement, who was very present uh, in Greece at the time. I don't agree with all of Toussaint's you know, judgments or verdicts on the facts, but he pointed Toussaint uh, made it very clear that Varoufakis, being the finance minister, was in a position to, for example, uh, to fire, well, maybe that's not the word, but to unseat the chairman of the Greek central bank, who was a neoliberal, <clears throat> Sturnaras, Sturnaras, who had also been a professor at uh, the University of Athens, 
and Stuart Naras. Um, Stuart Naras' great claim to fame was having lassoed Greece miraculously into the European Union, uh, making Greece what it always has been historically the exception in the Balkans. With all the other Balkan countries, the socialists, I mean, not by our standards, but they were, they had, they were, uh, okay, Stalinist or, well, no, Tito was not a Stalinist, but uh, Edward Hoxha of Albania, uh, Tito in Yugoslavia, Greece was the island of capitalism. And, you know, Greece again became an exception, as I, th I think at the time, the only, I might be wrong, because maybe Slovenia, I think Slovenia was a later addition. So Greece was an island of capitalism, I, island of the, it was the, uh, sorry, Greece was uh, a member of the EU mm -hmm. uh, when Serbia could not access the EU. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, and, and Stunaras had somehow, he was uh, credited with having been extremely uh, beguiling or tricky or clever in negotiating or selling Greece into the, the monetary union. Mm -hmm. And so there was no, since that was his claim to fame, there was no way in hell that Stubnaras uh, was going to give up on that and go along with Srita's program of maybe getting Greece out of the monetary union and into, uh, you see, there are two, there are two spheres of the EU, right? Just as there are many circles of hell in Dante, <laughs> mm -hmm. many circles of purgatory, right? So mm -hmm. if you are very close to the masters, the, 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 the you know, the, the Vikings, the, 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 these, you know, blondes, you know, uh, people who are good at accounting, uh, if you're very close to, uh, if you want to be close to the Benelux, to the ne Netherlands and Germany and so, so on. Uh, you want to have the euro, the currency, but you can also be like Bulgaria, or you can be like Romania, who are not in the the, the monetary. They don't have the currency; they have their own currency, but they are members of the European Union. Mm -hmm. They have a, they're, they're not in the inner circle of the European Union. Uh, Schengen is that it's uh, has been. I used to, you know, I, I think I've purposefully forgotten some mm -hmm. But, um, you know, so Bulgaria is is a member of the EU with its own currency, which has a national hero, uh, Bills, the guy who fought the Turkish. And so they can devalue their currency. They can devalue the leva if they are in trouble, if there is inflation. And Yanis Fernandes himself pointed out many times, that's the wonderful freedom that they have with their currency. Whereas if you are if you are using the euro, uh, you can't uh, you cannot uh, devalue. Right? And so the EU, the Central Command in Brussels, was very afraid that their power would be reduced to some meaningless provincial bureaucracy if the Greeks decided to exit, not exit completely, but rather to become like one of these loose cannons, like Poland. Poland is a big headache for the EU, has been. Because Poland's a very subversive country. Poland's, with its right-wing nationalist patriotic government, have had some anti-neoliberal positions, some positions of, you know, a pitchfork village revolt against the EU. Uh, mm -hmm. But they were able to, to provoke and to undermine the power of the EU in some ways that are quite terrible also. Uh, you know, like their revisionism of history or their messing with civil liberties, but they were able to do what they wanted. They were free to do that, uh, largely because they are not on a leash with the euro because they have the zloty currency that can be devalued. So they are a little bit more loose. They are, they have a, they, are, they have more room to, to, to do, to do this kind of subversion. Whereas Greece, because of the euro, currency and cannot value was much more tightly gripped by Brussels. And so 
the a nightmare for Brussels would be for more and more countries to step out of what they had signed on to the targets. And so the 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 the, 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 the power in Brussels was very uh, concerned about that. But mm -hmm. they were able to call the bluff of of, of the Greeks of the city Sagoth. Because for some reason, uh, their favorites, Sturnaras, the, 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 the chief of the central bank, for some reason, he remained in place. And Tsipras and others at Silitsa were asking Varoufakis, who is the minister of finance, the one who can make these decisions, to remove this figure. Uh, but the fact that Varoufakis would make uh, pyrotechnical speeches, appearances, talk a lot, uh, like an academic walking into a room, thinking he can resolve everything by talking a lot, but did not remove the chairman of the central bank, who was clearly the agent of the EU, of Berlin, and of Brussels' interests, because mm -hmm. there was no way in hell that Stuart Maddox was going to go along with Greek threats to become like Bulgaria, or like Poland, or like Hungary of Orban, which is another nightmare for the EU. They, there was no, they were really rest assured that they could keep calling the guy, the, the bluff of Tsipras and, and of, and of Varoufakis because the guy stayed sitting there on his laurels in the, in the central bank. Uh, and he happened to be a friend and somebody who had advocated for Varoufakis' academic career at the University of Athens. That's how it works. And so it, seem, it seems to suggest that petty politics of academia uh, took the priority and overrode the, 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 the demands, of the, pop, the popular demands of the interests, the dignity of the Greek people. Um, but somehow all of this was forgotten because Anthakis, um uh, was very, very uh, smart and agile in finding the right time, the right way, <clears throat> and the right phrasing to distance himself just in time, to distance mm -hmm. himself from the sinking ship. But it's not as if he was in an emasculated position from the beginning. He had the, the, the tools at his disposal but he chose to, to talk a lot instead. Well, I want to ask you a question about... Um, PowerPoints you know, instead of power. PowerPoints instead of power. Yeah. yeah. But, so, um, if... I remember at the time that this went down, that my stance, because I was part of a Marxist group at the time, and it was, I was kind of following the, 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 lead of, uh, the, the leader of the, the group, my stance was that neither staying in the EU nor leaving would ultimately uh, overcome the economic crisis that was wrecking Europe and Greece, especially at the time. And that the the concern about leaving the EU was not that, yeah, you could devalue the currency then, but that devaluation itself is no solution for economic recession or depression um, unless there is a a, a, a a relationship that you can have with the rest of Europe where they're able to take advantage of the cheaper goods in your country and increase your exports. But if you have a move that where you end up with inflation and the rest of Europe is sent into a spiral of, of perhaps its own inflation or some other economic crisis that strikes the rest of Europe as it as it cracks apart like if Greece were to leave and then Spain were to leave and you know uh, then 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 you will have massive inflation in Greece and very little uh, support from the rest of Europe uh, due to the spread of what at the time was a global economic crisis not just contained within Greece. So I didn't, it seemed like the Syriza and everyone was caught between a rock and a hard place. There wasn't going to be a monetary solution 
or a techni technical solution or, you know, a political solution within the bounds of normal politics that would emerge uh, at that time. What do you what do you make of that, you know, far left, maybe ultra leftist pessimistic position? Well, no, it's it's a, it's a wise uh, uh, analysis. I, I'm, I'm not uh, an economist. Uh, uh, really, but uh, uh, first of all, Greece was more or less designated to be a kind of fall guy, scapegoat for certain crises and upsets that were affecting the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this was very well documented, it's, uh, exposed by not only by uh, Varoufakis. By uh, economists like Ulrich Beck, uh, a mm -hmm. German economist, uh, who was very good at uh, very keen on analyzing uh, German power in the EU. I think it's a pity that Ulrich Beck has been almost forgotten since mm -hmm. he died around the time of the Greek crisis. But he was very much very sympathetic to the Greeks and to the other countries that were being called the pigs. So Portugal, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain, where that's called pigs in the new slang of neoliberal economists, because they were seen as the, the weak spots that were bringing, uh, the EU down this road of crisis. Uh, I think that, uh, inflation, there are ways to deal with inflation, uh, for a country that just that still preserves the civic life and keeps people uh, fed and employed to, uh, to some extent. And uh, there's, there are ways to navigate inflation, as Argentina has done, without losing one's sovereignty. But there are other problems like stagflation and like, like deflation. Uh, Zarufakis himself pointed out that what happened just before the Second World War, and uh, just before the, the immense growth of the Nazi movements among German lower middle classes, was deflation, uh, not inflation. Deflation, that he rightly pointed out, is, is, is uh, more dangerous. So, so I, I, I agree that that there was no way out of all this, uh, of some kind of turbulence. I agree with you. However, there should have been a maintenance of some sovereignty to avoid the the, the, the roads of austerity measures and of countries losing their sovereignty to the austerity uh, policies, the austerity command centers in Brussels and Berlin. There were ways to, to defend some form of popular sovereignty. And these opportunities, either they were lost or frustrated or squandered by the left, by Podemos in Spain and by uh, Chivitza. And now we see Portugal. I don't know much about Portuguese politics, but I see the Portuguese left is now facing a very right-wing contender. So I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen there. But uh, in Greece, it's, it's more or less clear what happened. Uh, mm -hmm. So, a thirst for expertise in Syriza because the people in Syriza were aware that they didn't have a lot of experience, they didn't have the same connections that very established and very corrupt politicians had. And mm -hmm. So they were looking for expert voices and they found one in Martin Farkas. So, yeah. At that time, he had been working for Steam uh, as a um, either right before or after steam is this video game company and he had been in charge with creating virtual currencies and virtual economies within the different game systems that they would would, would put out and sell and then he went from that to being the ministry of finance for syriza i think mm -hmm. um, i had the playstation once but it was stolen by a burglar and i did not replace it well I had kids who had Steam accounts, and I, I heard about Giannis Varoufakis being involved. And, like, if you wanted to go into a game and 
you know, spend money to buy virtual items in the game. Verifacus was behind the scenes counting the beans, I think. But um, the, uh, the, the question I have when I, I read your article, I mean, there's a lot of very familiar uh, rhetoric on both sides or, or, or ways in which to frame and understand the politics in your piece. For instance, I was surprised to discover that under Verifacus there's been a turn away from class politics and towards I guess intersectionality and and radical feminism within the his party is that correct? Yeah, uh, I would have expected it. I mean, when I signed on to DM, I, I signed on the reason why many people signed on is angry at this German Germanic self righteousness. These these nice Protestants, you know, countries who seek their soul. Uh, Go the two shoes and immune to corruption and, and putting the people in the south of Europe in their place hmm. as moral inferiors. I was very sort of uh, irritated by that. And I saw Varoufakis as a response to that, a rejection of that culture. And then when I entered the movement, I looked at the forum of the movement, which, by the way, has an interface that looks like a video, a kind of primitive video game, like or an hmm. old school. I don't know, Tetris or something, mm -hmm. and, uh, and which I guess is why it appeals mostly to male, male users, not <laughs> a lot of girls, and, uh, which is a problem in the movie. And, um, and then I, I noticed that DM has reproduced a kind of microcosm of the EU within the movement. So German members are the ones who pay the membership fee on time. Mm -hmm. People want, they sign up for an activity, they pay for the activity, and they want to participate. They want to see results from the activity. Mm -hmm. As the Italians sign up, then they half friends. They're just, uh, and say, they're just fooling around. And so the, the, the German membership and the Western membership, the Danish, the Dutch members, and uh, other German members. People from Strasbourg, France, they were much more loud, much more seriously expected results, which is a good thing. But they were very serious in asserting and imposing their values on the movement uh, in opposition to uh, these people who are from the more subaltern countries. And so the people from these sub altern countries, formerly Bolshevik, um, uh, Greece, Spain, wherever, were more likely to be suspect of corruption, of macho behavior, uh, corruption, uh, getting benefits they didn't deserve. Uh, and uh, some of these accusations were justified. Uh, I mean, there's not a lot of clarity as to where the money is, how it's being distributed. It's all a volunteer economy. Everyone's a volunteer, a few exceptions in the M25, but Farnfakis is a wealthy man. So it could pay somebody some kind of fee, however puny, but, uh, or maybe not. No, because the economists are stingy. <laughs> Well, but, so um, the, uh, the the when you say that they were imposing their values, you're not talking about policy disputes, but just about internal values or and behavior in the organization. Is that is that what you're talking about? Uh, their values, well, about uh, green, uh, uh, intersectional feminism, transgender issues. Uh, Germans were especially averse to any uh, position on Israel-Palestine that was not uh, uh, to the rights of the Israeli left. Uh, Germans wanted a very clearly uh, pro-Israel, pro-Israeli uh, pro liberal establishment position. Uh, uh, so the, the, there was a centrality to identity politics 
a lot of people were talking about veganism, unfortunately, uh, and there was an aversion to an aversion to geopolitics. Also, when it came to foreign policy, uh, I got into a lot of conflicts with people, uh, which I, I did not take very personally because. I'm used to talking to people who are centrists, right wing, mm -hmm. giving my difference of opinion. But I noticed that people of a centrist position, so for example, people who, who wanted uh, sanctions against Venezuela mm -hmm. by the EU, which is a big problem. The EU going along with American sanctions pro politics, it's a huge problem. Uh, many countries would find it easier to breathe. If the US, if the EU did not go along with the sanctions on Iran, uh, mm. which was a total mm. contradiction of EU position. Many people in, in Cuba and other in Iran, in, uh, in Afghanistan, many other countries would be, there'd be less hunger and less strife if the EU did not always go along with these sanctions. But, but these, when you would talk to a centrist who wanted to, what would you encounter? When, when you would talk to centrists who wanted to go along with the sanctions, you were comparing them, I think, to the people on the left, the, the, the center. The people on the, on the left would attack you and the centrists would attack you and you were, you were accustomed to both, right? So Yeah. Yeah, so people would put, on, would put up memes or would say, uh, somebody, somebody who was clearly, clearly living in Berlin said, oh, you're all a bunch of white leftists in Berlin who don't, understand, who don't care about the real problems of the people in Venezuela. Uh, I, I grew up on an island that's like 30 kilometers off the coast of Venezuela. I know many Venezuelan people, and I know that nobody is benefiting from these sanctions, whether or not they right. like do it. It's, it's causing terrible suffering in the EU. Yeah. So we would get these usual accusations of uh, misogyny, white privilege, uh, being nasty, being Putin agents. Uh, there were people who were, you know, uh, there were many people who were spreading this kind of uh, basically Russiagate disinformation. Uh, mm -hmm. There were real believers in Russiagate in the movement, just as there are in in, in, the, in Europe, so it, I guess it was a symptom of the success of Badufakis, uh, that, uh, and, but also uh, um, a result of the movement's recruitment campaign, which was basically to welcome anyone who was not far right into the movement. Uh, the movement's initial way of campaigning, uh, strangely, was to claim that DM would be was a necessary bulwark against the European far right. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think Diem should have campaigned as a movement, simply a real opposition rather than a empty, you know, cynical yeah. racists. Oh, when you, uh, oh. when you run as the bulwark against the far right, yeah, you're kind of running as the shock troops for the center left. They, they realized that later on, and they, re they regretted their decision. But it was too late because a big part of the base had signed up for precisely that purpose, to be shark troops. And so and they were bullying a lot of leftists. Uh, when it came to Israel-Palestine, it was hilarious because a, a, a big, quite a number of people who were on our side in Israel-Palestine debates uh, were Jewish members of the Whereas the, 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 the people who are very aggressively defending, uh, uh, talking about anti-Semitism, making accusations of those were very clearly people who had surnames, they were from Germany and they had surnames that rhyme with Himmler, uh, basically. <laughs> so it was a very comical situation. <laughs> uh, 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 our position, our group's position on Israel-Palestine, uh, did not win at the end, as I mentioned earlier, because that's yeah. when Badalfakis went into competition with his own foreign policy group. The whole foreign policy group resolved into thin air after that, for various mm. reasons, unfortunately. Right. So, so it seems like the uh, 
intersectional or woke or whatever you have to call it politics um pc right pc it that that it was used in diem and to the same in the same way that it was used in the democratic party in the united states and that it again was coming from the most affluent uh members of diem and coming yeah. at least from the most affluent countries right so it was a yes. A, a, a political weapon used by the affluent against the left within its own ranks. Should you say that? Yes, is, right? yes. And, and the leadership was very concerned about how to resolve this. Uh, they, they kept attempting all kinds of uh, PR tactics because they were a movement that flourished with good PR and they felt that every problem could be resolved with PR or with tech or with, or with something, or an algorithm. And I, I told them, and I, at first they very much liked my ideas. Uh, I told them that the way to resolve this problem is to, to organically address these issues. So it's true that there weren't enough people from the minorities uh, active in DM. It's true that DM wasn't engaging women in a particularly interesting way to them. Uh, but then you have to find ways and, and, and of course, or support, most importantly, or most inclusively the working class. Uh, but then you have to find sincere, organic ways of interesting people. And one of the ways to do that, I said, is with foreign policy, uh, because you know, people won't need all these formulas like intersectionality or, you know, like when I would go to DM conferences, like I went to one in Cologne, where these strange people who would suddenly start, you know, and uh, moderators would suddenly start shouting, now we need a woman to ask a question. And mm -hmm. this was very paralyzing. Why, why would a woman want to be the woman who now asks a question? Uh, yeah, yeah. So these, these woke uh, formulas are all artificial. And I believe there were, you had to interest uh, right. to get the real diversity without the wokeness. You have to, to interest that, those audiences with their issues. And, and that, but then you run into many taboos. So for example, uh, I said, with foreign policy, I mean, all the young people from minorities in Europe, the majority of them are who live in Europe as second generation immigrants, the new working, the working class or the new middle class. They are mostly from the countries that are very much impacted, if not devastated by, by US and European foreign policy and the policies of the IMF. So they're from, mm -hmm. from the Middle East, from North Africa, usually off of Africa. Uh, and so th those young people who have a lot of passion have a, a dual interests, you know, because on the one hand, you know, they grew up, they studied Belgium, Germany, or France, whatever, and so they had the opportunities of these countries. On the other hand, they're very interested in the countries their parents came from. So foreign policy is, you know, to focus on foreign policy, Europe's terrible foreign policy. It's, it's void of foreign just going along in a slimy and uh, disgusting way with whatever the, the America, with whatever uh, uh, demented by the West, whatever mm. they do uh, to their own detriment. Uh, I think, you know, confronting that lack of foreign policy would be very important and interesting uh, diverse groups of people. Uh, and, um, and also to interest more women you have to have a, a less digital interface type of, you know, you have to have, uh, you have to have be less virtual, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and to look less like a video game basically. And mm -hmm. so, um, at first they were very interested in what I was saying, and, uh, but, but then they decided to rely on the, the formulas of game theory and public relations, because that's media codes, good video so on and so forth, which has that all those things have their merits, of course. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
Yeah, so it, it it's it's worth noting um, that dynamic. But I what what I when I was reading your piece, I really was struck by how it, it seemed to me that the um, that, I mean what you were talking about was the defeat of the European radical movement, and what I couldn't help but notice was a description uh, the, the lack of any description of a uh, re- European radical movement that defined itself as aiming at something outside of the paradigm of what was kind of on the table within the EU already. Like it seemed to me like it was framed uh, like it, it certainly the European radical movement. And this is, I'm showing my biases here. There was, it wasn't a Marxist radical movement, right? It was a, would, would you say it was defined by the kind of new, new deal, social democratic, politics of Farifakis from the beginning, that it, that that was where it remained the whole time? Um, Not even that. Uh, it was defined by the, well, by the Green New Deal. Uh, mm-hmm. The Green New Deal. But many people did not really know the details of the Green New Deal. Mm-hmm. Many people were simply misled by the title. Because the New Deal is a reference for America. Americans owe many things to the New Deal. In Europe, they didn't have the New Deal. They had the Marshall Plan, which was uh, imposed very differently. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, social democracy came about after the loss of the colonies and mm-hmm. the defeat in World War II. So it's a very different uh, reference or frame of reference for Europeans, but mm-hmm. they call mm-hmm. it Green New Deal. Because, you know, AOC is very cute and popular. So let's sound like we're on board with AOC of Europe. <laughs> so, yeah, it sounds like very much like this was a, a it's kind of a pseudo left organization. Yes. Ultimately, um, there, there are there are I don't want to because I, I don't want to I'm, I'm not I'm not doing this to betray uh, people who I still consider my friends. Who, are, who I met in the movement, especially when I went to Athens, there are people who are genuinely of the left and who are one hundred percent serious and believe in and who are in. Sad. The... That's that's even worse, because yeah. now you've got these people who are legitimately of the left and who believe in socialism and who would like to see yeah. something more develop. Waste well, their time. Young, they're young and they believe in Varoufakis, so they've been to his house and he has a very nice house. Oh well. Okay then. <laughs> I'm sure he that's, does. That's kind of that. Um yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean look, I'm not, is very convincing. Like I here's how I think people should treat Verfakis overall. It's like you should listen to his ideas and critique them. He's 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 on the left. He should be taken up and uh, uh you know, but but to um but then you have to take those critiques seriously. You know, and and I think that uh, overall, the people will, from my perspective, in the United States as an American leftist, it I think about everything in terms of the Sanders campaign and the kind of the 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 dirtbag left and the uh, the millennial left that rose up and had a, a podcast and it was very online and digital as well, and I was sort of uh, I came around before they came around, but I was sort of writing their coattails in terms of views and things like that. Um, I came out of a subculture. I wasn't political. I was just sort of the subcultural podcaster. Um, but well, in any a science case, fiction writer. Right, science fiction writer and a, some sort of artist. And I made a podcast that was far left at a time when, you know, I was thinking about Marxism at a time when that wasn't, you know, Obama was had just been elected. So that wasn't really in the cards. Um, at that moment, it didn't seem to be. Uh, but then it, it turned out by 2011, no, there was a millennial left that was coming up. In any case, the, my my point is like when you when you listen to like people at Chapo Trap House, I remember interviewing Matt Christman, who's one of the podcasters there. He too would talk about the need to return to a new deal in the American context that had more resonance. But um, if you read their book uh they put out uh for chapo i forget the name of the book 
but they start out by critiquing FDR as a as the savior of capitalism and as offering up a policy that ultimately uh you know could not overcome the problems in society and that you know was a a, a blow against socialism because they're considering themselves socialists but by the end of the book they're calling for the new new deal they're calling for a return to the welfare state policies of 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 Roosevelt and and I asked them why 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 did you do that why why did you embrace the very politics that at the beginning of your book said led us to this impasse to begin with and their answer was well there was nothing more on the horizon we had we couldn't we couldn't go beyond that because there was that was just un, it would be unrealistic to try to say anything beyond uh, so, so it's accepting like, that defeat. So it's like Mark Fisher's uh, saying that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of the capitalists. Right, exactly. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both. <laughs>